Okay, look at that. Um, this is dark time. Doctor, say your name, 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 name. Ah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you make it that. I am very interested in the between these two schools. The second time they've been here in Birmingham. Last time it was 84 in this building, collecting in the names of the fans that by themselves. Chief Jeff is there. This is I was falling in love with college basketball. Right now, Kevin Willard hoping for a deep performance to be seen interact together here in the second half. Almost a repeat of the first. an informal oh yes thank you
Are we still waiting for people? So Matt, I, I don't know if you're, we're intending to, to talk to everyone, but I don't think we can't hear you. So I don't know if you're, you're on mute. Try it now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Has, has nobody heard me talking for the last couple of minutes? No. no. I don't, I'll be stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'll just reiterate that um, I'm joined here today with uh, Matt Kassain and April from Fuss and O'Neill, our civil engineers, Greg Tuzolo from Stimson Landscape Architects. And we're going to really just focus on our preliminary site plan thoughts today, which is the result of uh, some conversations that we've been having with Fuss and O'Neill and Stimson about this property um, with the understanding of you know, the current mapped wetlands and associated wetland buffers, which you can see here in this slide, um, which is, you know, since working here 12 years ago is, you know, considerably more extensive. Uh, and so we're obviously going to need to be careful about how we site building, parking, driveway, and septic. Uh, because of the high water table, we're going to end up with a raised septic system here. Uh, and so, you know, if that fits two to three feet above natural grade, that has an impact then on where we can put it relative to other things. It can't be located right next to the building because the building will sit at grade so as to be accessible. And then we would have a raised septic right next to it. So there's a kind of awkward relationship. And so finding a, a home for the septic field is, uh, is one of the first things that we considered. The other thing to note is that um, you can see in the in the middle of the site here around where the, the garage used to be, uh, we've got an overlap of the 100 foot buffer. So anything that we do to access the building, which is likely going to be, you know, in, in, back in this portion of the site, um, kind of nestled in here between the buffers, we're going to have to come through that buffer with our driveway. Um, and so we've got a couple of different scenarios, but you know where the driveway goes relative to existing, uh, the, you know, current uh, driveway location relative to existing trees, et cetera, is something we've been thinking about. So to get right into these, and um, I, uh, Greg, I will just run through quickly presenting these three site plans, and then please chime in, and Matt and April, you too, um, as we as we go through this with any specific comments or thoughts that you guys have. So we have three options. Um, all of these are based on a single story building of roughly you know, 6,000 square feet based on the building program, 6,000 gross square feet. Uh, in this scheme, we were, we were organizing it as a you know, fairly simple um, bar building under a single slope roof uh, again, kind of tucked at the back of the site in between the wetlands because we're trying to create some outdoor space adjacent to the library for outdoor programming. Um, and the fact that we're trying to fit parking and septic in, we, you can see that the building has actually pushed a little bit forward into the buffer. It's a little bit hard to read the 100 foot buffer on this slide, but the heavier dashed line is the 50 foot buffer. So we're trying to keep everything out of the 50 foot buffer with the potential that we do some work in the 50 to 100 foot buffer um, and then with you know remediation or, as, as much as we can um, for any work any disturbance that we do in that in that 50 feet between 50 and 100. Um, as you can see the driveway comes in using the western most uh, ingress it's, a, it's currently a loop drive so we're using the one that's further up on the page. It bends around that um, existing spruce tree, crosses over the site of the former garage building. And you know, we we sort of thought that putting 
possibly putting some parking on that site as a way to uh, kind of cap a previously disturbed area that had some challenging soils might be one possibility and a way to kind of reduce the overall size of parking. We, we think we need about somewhere in the range of 14 to 16 cars for this parking lot, given the size of the building. Um, the, the building itself, we are thinking it's oriented east-west, and so that means it can have south-facing roof. We want to have a photovoltaic system on this building. We, ideally, we're going to achieve net zero, so we're thinking that we'll need all of the roof area to provide enough solar that we can achieve net zero. So this is a diagram that just compares if we were to do a gable roof versus a single pitch roof. On a gable roof, only half of that roof area is available for solar. On a single slope roof, 100% of the roof area is, although it's it's not doubling the roof area, but, but it would increase the available area by, by about 33%. The other thing that is notable is that on a pitched roof scheme, half of the, the rainwater that would shed off of that building would be sloping towards the wetlands, whereas the other half would go uh, outside the buffer. Whereas in the single slope, we could direct all of the rainwater away from the wetland resources to uh, an area outside the buffer where it could be collected and treated uh, perhaps more easily. So those were some of the considerations that that we were thinking about as it related to, to that uh, building in that orientation. Another site plan option rotates that building 90 degrees, um, which has less, you know, touches the 50 foot buffer again. It extends a little bit further west, but still comes just up to the 100 foot buffer on the, or sorry, to the south. Um, it goes right up to the 100 foot buffer on the south, but doesn't encroach on the 100 foot there. Um, parking has a strong relationship to building and building entry in this one, with the distinct difference between the, the side of the building facing parking and the side facing the reading garden. Um, again, in the, as in the last one, the front, the front kind of meadow area is left mostly open, with the exception of the driveway going through it. Uh, in this case, we would take a similar approach and do a single slope roof uh, to maximize the availability of solar uh, and to um, direct rainwater to a single location where we can easily collect. And whether we're able to reuse or not, I think it'll be dependent on, on cost, um, but at least it, it's sending it to a single place in terms of stormwater management. And then finally, we've been looking at an L-shaped scheme, which is kind of a, a blend of the, the other two, a slightly different parking diagram here. Um, one advantage that we see of the L is that it starts to define outdoor program space um, a little bit better than, than a simple bar building does. Creates a, a more private, maybe more intimate um, outdoor program space for the library that's you know, directly accessible from indoor programming provides a little bit of buffer, you know, with one wing of the building between parking and that outdoor space, and then presents a long front to the street. Um, it's, in this case, uh, it's located fully outside of the 100 foot buffer with maybe some landscaping work encroaching in the 100 foot. Um, the, part, the driveway and parking again has to go through that buffer to get back as far as the building. In all of these, we're going to need to consider emergency vehicular turnaround, um, which we'll want to talk to the fire department about. Um, I think it's this driveway is probably too long to think that an emergency vehicle is going to pull in and then back out. So we're going to need to provide some way for the vehicle to turn around. And whether that's a paved surface that provides the turnaround and whether it's a you know full uh, you know, circle turnaround, or if it's a place where a truck can perform a K turn, or it's um, a you know reinforced natural turf that uh, that allows for weight bearing for for the emergency vehicles, which we've done in a number of projects and works pretty well. That's something we'll we'll need to consider. The other thing that I I didn't mention in any of these, but our approach is the same in all three of these schemes, and that's the septic field. 
Um, right now, we're estimating that the septic leaching field is about 50 feet by 100 feet. Uh, that has to be confirmed with occupancy counts, uh, working with the septic designer. But um, the, the strategy in all of these is to locate it in the northeast corner of the site where we, we already have some existing uh, vegetated buffer along the property line and along the street. Um, we would orient it with grading so it can kind of nestle into the high grade on the back side, and then we can uh, slope, you know, berm up to it on the other sides gradually, uh, and then increase potentially the planting buffer around it, uh, you know, on the property line side and the street side. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's outside of the of the 50 foot buffer. It encroaches a little bit on the 100 foot buffer. Um, but it's it's in this kind of pocket of area that's outside the 100 foot buffer. I think this is the line of the 100 foot here. So one corner of it is encroaching in the 100 foot. Um, and we have the opportunity here to to plant around it pretty uh, substantially to to um, minimize its visual impact on on the road and many of others. Mary has a question. Yes, Mary. Mary, can I unmute yourself? Hi, yes, thanks. I'm the chair of the Shrewsbury Conservation Commission. Um, the well for 62 Leverett Road is apparently just in front of their garage under the pavement. Looks like you're within 100 feet. Are you, um, have you considered that? Um, we don't know where that well is located. So if it's possible to get a, a plan that shows that, we can. We can certainly work with that. I think right now the septic field is located 30 feet from, there's a 30 foot setback from the property line and from the road um, it, as it's drawn here. So it would need to move further west if it, you know, depending on where that well is to maintain the 100 foot separation. But if, if we can get a copy of that plan, that would be helpful. Yeah, we, we, we did a site visit um, with the landowner and she told us the well was right in front of her driveway, park, right in front of her garage. Okay. So th there isn't a plan, okay. uh, but uh, but I also spoke to the property owner and she told me that I was gonna tell you that the well was underneath the pavement, right in front of the garage. And the garage is, you know, you can see it. Um, right. I assume it's this. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's you're saying it's in the pavement here. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So okay. So I mean, it it would be helpful to have that located on a survey. I don't know if that's something that your surveyor could add to our survey. Well, so you're gonna you're, you're gonna send gonna, me a list, so we'll yeah. add that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I guess the same is true for the other abutting properties to the west too. Just Nothing no, below that. Nothing nearby. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Greg and Matt, I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add to these. Um, and and one question too is that that we had was about disturbance within the fifty for construction, uh, and what you know what we would need to do after. That kind of, you know, if, if there's room there to expand, to, to develop uh, up to the 50, knowing that we're going to encroach in the 50 during construction, would need to put back, um, you know, sort of restore that area after that disturbance. Um, thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Tizzolo with Stimson. I just have a couple of things that I'll add. Um, on all of these, drawings there's a, a sort of a green tone and it's really the beginning of an attempt to kind of represent uh tree clearing or you know what would need to be cleared for the um the development of parking driveway building um it's just sort of another factor to overlay on top of uh, as i imagine that you know tree clearing um, is certainly of concern so it's it's a first attempt. It's very you know schematic in nature, or, you know even conceptual. I'd say, you know, given that we have um, a request for an improved um, uh, an updated survey with a bit more detail, 
you know, we certainly will be in a position to make, you know, very careful decisions about either clearing or selective removal of trees in various areas. But, you know, I, I guess just on a related note, the um, uh, clearing for solar resource for the PV array on the building is, is one concern. Uh, aside from just simply construction disturbance, you know, we want to make sure that uh, wherever the building goes has adequate um, solar exposure. And I would, we're not, a lot of the material certainly in the, you know, more in, in this part of the site, I'd say is less mature uh, than, than just from memory, everything back here is sort of a bit more dense and a bit more, I guess, mature, perhaps some older uh, white pines or at least taller white pines. Um, so perhaps it's less of a concern sort of upfront, at least in terms of the solar exposure. But it, regardless, that's that's just uh, what the drawings are attempting to portray. And, and you know, so the in, in other words, the position of the building is obviously an important factor, but then the associated tree clearing adjacent to the building both for solar and for just constructability is, is also a factor to consider. Um, I guess I'll just also say that, um, you know, from a driveway and parking perspective, we, you know, the, these three concepts are pretty much the same idea. You know, it's, it's sort of a long linear thread of driveway and parking that's really trying to kind of thread the needle, if you will, right there, and get, you know, get us through this sort of bottleneck and into the, the kind of heart of the site or the heart of the sort of developable area. Um, <clears throat> we're very open to uh, your feedback in terms of any, um, various, any of the various ways that we're approaching parking. You know, in other words, we can stretch it out and provide more kind of interim green space, or we could consolidate it, make it as kind of compact and tight as possible to just limit the overall, uh, you know, amount of, of hardscape. Um, we're just trying to represent a few different possible perspectives on that with the, the kind of main concept remaining the same, that being, you know, this kind of, you know, locating the curb cut in this uh, westernmost existing access point so as to not disturb stone walls um, and also obviously these you know or really these these wetlands kind of on either side are really kind of pulling us to you know towards that scheme and i'd say that it's probably also very much tied to the feasibility of locating the septic in this corner so i appreciate the feedback about the adjacent well i think that's an important thing that we really need to um, look at much more closely, you know, very soon to make sure that that um, the general concept of placing the septic in that corner of the site is is feasible. Matt Nagel, have anything to say? Um, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I don't think we really have anything to add it at this point. Um, obviously, we, we now have the ORAD in hand um, for the delineation. Um, I think the buffers shown here are, are generally in line with where they're going to to be based off of the ORAD, um, I guess subject to change slightly based off that cemented delineation, um, obviously with the exception of, of those two flags. Um, you know, like uh, like Matt was saying earlier, I think the intent is to try to just kind of, we, we kind of chose, you know, the 50 foot buffer as kind of a arbitrary, you know, if we can keep our disturbance, you know, as, you know, much as possible outside of the 50 foot buffer. Um, you know, we're going to strive to do that. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's our understanding that, you know, disturbance into the 50 foot buffer is, is allowable, obviously, with, with, you know, potentially certain conditions. But, um, 
you know, that's one way that we're trying to minimize any sort of potential Im impact to, you know, resource area and buffer area is by kind of drawing in that line. Yeah, and it'd be great to hear the commission members um, if they have any specific concerns or aspects that they like or dislike um, with each of these different layouts, if there are any certain red flags or anything that should be taken into consideration. All right. Hi, can you, um, I am. I was just actually fumbling because I was trying to pull up the uh, other pictures because it's um, it's kind of helpful to kind of look at them all. Give me one sec so I can see. So there's the um, the north south um, orientation, which looks like um, they're all going to have roughly the same length of driveway. Or are you thinking that the driveway would be shorter? Um, I guess it's one of my questions with one any of these options in terms of the. Greg, you can chime in here, but my understanding is that they're going to be fairly similar. You know, we're we in order to get the parking located sort of past that pinch point between the 50 foot buffers, we're going to have to come back, you know, 100 feet to the site and and. We want to get the parking close enough to the building entrance, um, so that you know that entrance shifts a little bit from scheme to scheme, but not not a tremendous amount. And so, in all of these, I think the parking is kind of get needing to be back this far from from the road. So we're talking about a you know roughly a three hundred and fifty foot uh, you know setback from the road to say the front of the building in all of these. About, the other um, question I had, and I know that these are early days, so this is all just you know conceptual. But have you thought about where you might be thinking about stormwater management with any of these designs around, the, particularly around the uh, the driveway parking area? I can speak to that if you'd like. Um, just to orient everyone. There's some background noise. I don't know. Someone else. Great. Right. Does that sound all right? I'm I, I'm sorry. I'm in a I'm in an office. I'll, I'll try to just uh, okay mute when I when I can. Um, so just to so everyone understands generally that the the general orientation of slopes in this site is is in that sort of northwestern direction, um, I would assume that, you know, we would look at, you know, this general zone to uh, sheet flow water and, and capture, treat, and convey. Uh, it, just sort of generally, um, you know, with the assumption or the understanding that we'd be, you know, getting closer to the resource so we've got to be you know careful about that of course but you know the degree degree to which we can kind of thread this road around the tree if if indeed the tree is ends up being something of value that we um, all agree to keep and we can kind of maintain enough space to try to you know stay outside or stay on the uphill side of that 50 foot buffer um you know, we 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 talked preliminarily with uh, Matt and his team about a variety of measures. Um, we're we're familiar with you know most of them, and I generally feel that there's you know plenty of opportunity for us to deploy any type of you know uh, passive stormwater capture treatment conveyance, uh, but it would likely be on the on the downhill side of our hardscape. It, it's also very possible that the water management for the rainwater collection for the building is going to be different than um, how we handle stormwater for the, the parking lot and the driveway. Um, but, you know, there is the potential for collection and reuse for irrigation. We've 
talked about that kind of in theory. I don't, you know, we'll have to see in practice if that's realistic for this project given the budget, but um, I think there's a potential opportunity there. But, you know, thinking about the, the area that Greg was just outlining for collection and conveyance for the paving, if you think about what the roof is doing in this scheme's orientation, it's sloping towards the south. And so it's kind of the rainwater coming off the roof is running in the opposite direction to the back of the building. And so we would be collecting there. And, you know, I will, we haven't talked yet about what kind of collection that's going to be or infiltration or how, you know, how that is managed. Matt, I don't know if you guys have given any thought to that yet. Still Sorry. Yeah, we're still kind of at the stage of, you know, our, our previous discussion, which is kind of tossing around some ideas, um, you know, but I think, you know, Amy was was starting to come up with some some ways that we, you know, can kind of minimize impacts and, and, you know, discuss some different options for collection, like you said, of rainfall for learning purposes or, you know, irrigation use, things like that. Um, so we'll, you know, as we get a little heavier into design, we can start, you know, throwing out some some more concrete ideas. I'll just also add that if if what what you're seeing on the screen is really a kind of compact design of a parking lot, but if we were to take an approach of kind of taking some some bites out of it, you know, with with vegetation. Yeah. Oops. There we go. Yeah, some of these other schemes are showing, oh, well, we can kind of expand the footprint, the total footprint, but take bites out of the, you know, with with vegetation, then there's opportunities potentially for us to, um, to actually have dispersed collection of stormwater, you know, kind of internally to the parking lot that are, you know, less about kind of conveying all the water to a uh, the system over here and more about just kind of capturing it sort of locally you know in the parking area perhaps if that you know that's sort of one uh, i guess you could call it an advantage of a more dispersed parking scheme is that we could kind of centrally collect stormwater closer to where it falls treat it in sort of smaller bits and then maybe it's conveyed via pipe to uh, where it's released so lots of different options um i i guess i'll also Maybe just ask the question, you know, um, the, that my understanding on, you know, passive stormwater management like bioswales, it is very much dependent on infiltration and existing soils and um, haven't yet heard if, if any kind of test pits or if there's a general understanding of whether the site lends itself well to infiltration um based on you know the natural soil conditions Miriam you had raised your hand before thanks um so are you thinking um that you're not going to need uh any stormwater treatment to the east in that uh between the driveway and that uh 50 foot VVW line is that the if, where that red line is that's a 50 foot or is that the 100 foot I can't see on this along the eastern property BVW2 that's the 50 foot buffer off of the resource okay are you thinking along that um stretch of a then there'll be a need for some sort of conveyance I can I can say that I I feel like we can definitely pitch the hardscape to the west, you know, very very easily. So we um, what so in any water that we have to manage off of the hardscape, we could certainly you know just get it to one side of the driveway only. Um, and uh, the other question I had is, has there been any thought about a? Um, like a semi-pervious surface for the driveway. Greg, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I, although I can tell you that from past projects, um, 
we've discussed that many times and we've never ended up implementing it because it requires so much maintenance. Uh, the pervious asphalt, tend, the pores tend to get clogged. It needs to be vacuumed to, to remain effective. So it, it, there's, a, there's a long term investment with that and it's more expensive going in. So, Greg, I don't know what your experience is with per, you know, pervious pavement. Yeah, I haven't, haven't seen a lot of success, to be honest. <laughs> it's uh, for, for the same reasons, Matt, that you outlined. It's, you know, it can be double to three times the cost up front. And then it, if it fails or is not maintained properly, then you, there's, no, there's no backup plan because you haven't built the, the, the adjacent infrastructure to deal with overland uh, runoff. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one to, uh, it's a tricky decision to have to commit yourself to that type, that level of maintenance over time. Um, you know, I think we found more luck in uh, more kind of concentrated areas where perhaps you would use more like a, like a concrete unit paver that has uh, permeability built into it. But as in, you know, from a square foot percent, uh, perspective is just much smaller um, it, it would be very costly to do it at, even at this scale so I, I have not seen a lot of success with that approach thank you I, I suspect a lot of the decisions that we make about stormwater management as Greg mentioned are going to come down to the results that we get from infiltration tests you know I from what we understand, there's a high water table here. We did a project recently in a similar kind of environment, surrounded by wetlands, very high water table, no infiltration. And so we ended up having to build in some storage capacity, basically, you know, a watertight Caltech system that allowed us to create some void under the parking lot to store some water and then slow release out into the wetlands. And that was combined with um, bioretention um, in the parking lot areas and, you know, again, holding it long enough that it could slowly work its way out into the wetlands and, and have some filtration by way of the, the planting in the bioswale. Um, but I think the, you know, how much infiltration we have here probably is going to influence a little bit the decisions that we make about stormwater. One, one thing I wanted to raise, you know, we've, we've said that we're trying as much as possible to stay out of the 50 foot buffer. Um, and that goes for clearing, but also for, you know, locating driveway, building footprint, et cetera. Um, there is one stand of white pines that is currently just west of the old uh, garage building. Um, and I'll circle it here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. So this, it's a fairly dense cluster of white pines. And whichever building scheme we end up pursuing, it's, it's, a, it's a real kind of visual impediment between Lever Road and the building and will obstruct views of the building. And you know, it's a, it's a public building that really wants to be seen from the road. And so I guess the question is, is there any leeway in, in particular with that stand of trees for partial or full removal, if there was maybe some, you know, counterbalancing measure somewhere else on the site. Mary, you've had your hand up before. So my question, this is Mary David. I'm on the Conservation Committee. So if I understood the green area around the library is all where trees are being removed. Um, and I guess in that area, what, what would be there after the trees are removed? Well, uh, we're not quite sure yet, <laughs> I, I guess, but I, I would assume that the, the green area represents, you know, clearing what exists, 
with per perhaps some selective uh, trees to remain when feasible. We have to look at grading, of course, and other impacts, utilities, et cetera. And we would certainly, I, I would say that, you know, for this area, the, you know, this sort of reading garden that we're beginning to, uh, uh, there's definitely more of a desire to potentially to keep, you know, existing trees, you know, to maintain shade and, and so forth. But, you know, again, grading is a limitation, certainly the, um, the solar resource on the building, another limitation. Um, so that would kind of dictate how we choose what to, to cut. Um, as far as what goes back, after that grading is done, after the building has been placed, I mean, we're, we're open to a, a lot of things. Uh, and, and, you know, we want to try to, you know, really, in my view, minimize a lot of the, the, the money that we spend on building other aspects of the infrastructure of the site so that we can um, preserve as much budget for revegetation. Um, but at the end of the day, or at least at this moment in time, we really don't know. And so once we learn more about, you know, the relationship of the landscape to what's going on in the interior of the building, where are the doors, windows, views that we want to preserve, um, relationship between indoor programming to outdoor programming. And then we'll start to formulate what these spaces want to be in terms of the space that's created, you know, where we want to obscure views, where we want things open, et cetera. Um, and craft a planting plan around that, that in, in my view, uh, I don't want to, maybe not aggressively, but heavily revegetates the site, you know, as much as we can. That's, you know, so I, I, I'm looking at that green zone as a, as a blank slate. Uh, and when, when we understand more about how the space works and how people, you know, need to move through that space and around and behave kind of adjacent to that space, then we'll, we'll certainly know more about um, how we might want to revegetate that space. So I, I just think too that the question that you just had about removing the trees um, for the visibility over here would probably be combined with how many trees or what's the amount of trees that are taken down for the project. Thanks. Don, you had your hand up. I, uh, Don Wapalook, Town Tree Warden. Um, I mean, at, at some point, I'd certainly like to have a discussion with you about the removal of all these trees for lawn area. I, I, I don't see any large shade tree type trees that would come under a tree warden's purview. Most of this stuff is pretty small diameter, and I, I. I'm, you know, I'm not going to argue with you about the value of those trees and the shading, as opposed to the temperature of the wetlands surrounding. Looks like you're far enough away. But um, I, I would advise the Conservation Commission to be considering what's going on with the with the stormwater, and uh, if you're going to remove that much vegetation and replace it with lawn area. Um, you know, let's have a discussion about fertilizers and uh, uh, the treatments that that grass is going to be needing um, in, you know, in correlation to the closeness of those wetlands. But I, I think your biggest problem is going to be uh, north of your site, where it looks to me like you're going to have to remove most, if not uh, all of those trees between uh, the wetland and the library in order to see the library. Um, if I can, just for a clear point of clarification, that you know this this green tone is is not meant to. It's it's a preliminary outline that's meant to show the kind of developed landscape. Let's call it. It's it's not intended to to propose lawn per se. Uh, there might be elements of lawn within there, but I you know I appreciate the. You know the impacts of lawn. That's not necessarily what's being proposed with that shape at this point. But I'll, I'll also add to that that we can be 
strategic about where we are um, disturbing, you know, as, as we need to erect this building, we're going to have, there, there's a certain working area that we're going to have to have at a minimum around the perimeter of the, of the building. And in some places, and we've, we've done this in other projects, we can tighten up that working area so that we are less disruptive on, say, you know, one particular side or a corner of the building where it's getting closer to a sensitive area and then create, you know, a, a larger staging areas elsewhere on the site where we've got a little more working room. And, you know, I, I think there are ways as we get into this to sort of strategize about how we do that in a way that's sensitive to the, the conditions around the building, whichever option that we choose. And, you know, as, as Greg said, our vision is not to have this building surrounded by lawn. It's really to have it feel like it's integrated into this landscape. Um, but but it's going to take some, there, there's going to be some disturbance in order to get the building and the parking and, you know, associated landscape around it to, to, to be created on this. But the hope is that at the end of the day, it feels like it's well integrated into this environment. And one thing I see is that on none of these exa um, examples here is the uh, town farm garden that we took to town. And I'm not saying that that's a deal breaker, believe me, but I'm just saying that that's uh, in terms of trying to figure out what to do with that extra land around the library, that's a potential. Right. We, we, uh, we cited the community gardens are going to be somewhere on this property. And we're just kind of waiting to right. see where we're going to be able to put it. And if there's room, do you know the dimensions? We have, we don't have dimensions. We don't have dimensions. Uh, okay. We must have. I think we were talking about an initial 12 plots. Um, I should, I, I can pull that up. Mm -hmm. Pull that up and send it to me and I'll send it to them. Okay. It's not, it's not part of this project. No, yeah, yeah. that's why. Right. right. I don't want to raise it because of right, it. right. But but here we are on the top of the site. But we right. raise the garden. Right. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, or the CPA go. money right. to develop a small community garden. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Can we do gardening on the wetlands? Yeah, you could do it in the buffer. In the buffer zone, we can do it. So it would it would be helpful to have some rough understanding of size. Okay. Um, Greg, if I if I remember, you guys did community gardens as part of the Hitchcock Center. Didn't you? Didn't, didn't oh, we some, did. Yeah. They actually did it on top of their septic mound. They did. Okay. In 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 raised beds. Yes. Raised beds. Yeah. So that's that's a possibility. I mean, that's about a five thousand square foot area potentially. Uh, yeah, and, and when we talk about gardening, you know, like Don said, lawn and um, and uh, and you know, we do want an outdoor place where we can all sort of sit and gather. Um, but um, but I think we're thinking pollinator gardens and forest, you know, edible um, forest gardens, and wildflower and and native. You know, Plants, yep. um, and uh, and you know, having this library and the grounds sort of blend into the natural surroundings, um, and not appear uh, sort of manicured or um, or Hmm? It's not a country club. It's, it's not, not a country, country club. Right. Where we might wouldn't get need a lawnmower for it. Right. Or suburban, right? <laughs> right. You know, um, I mean, but you know, so that you know, not that there's anything wrong with those things. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who like them. But you know, like some of us are transforming our yards from lawns to yeah. Right. So okay. How is the front part of the site currently maintained? Because it's I mean it's open meadow. Right. right. Is it is it cut back a couple times a year and just and otherwise left left to grow? Is that the that it that has been the standard yeah. for since the town bought? Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can I, can I just ask a question for a side reference? When you have that green oval where it says beauty garden, roughly what is the square footage of that? Just as we're thinking about various things. You know, well, Greg, you, you guys drew this diagram, so you may have a better idea what the size of that is. But if the building is 6,000 square feet, I would guess that's as drawn. That's kind of in the 3,000 square foot range. But these are diagrams, too. So, and and as Greg said earlier, the, you know, the reading garden may be, the character of that may be, you know, interspersed with, um, you know, some... Uh, pockets of trees, and it, you know, it, it's not. It's, this isn't meant to indicate kind of a big putty green. Right. I think just trying to get a, a sort of a side of this. Yeah. I, I, don't, I mean, Greg, you should speak to this, but I don't know that we have really gotten our heads around what uh, around how big that reading garden space may be, and and it varies from diagram to diagram. As you can see. You know, just toggling between these, and that's that's not to say these are proposals. It's just kind of locating where it could go. Not yet. I think. What it is. Yeah, I I totally agree. I think the most important aspect of the reading gardens, as depicted in these diagrams, is the relationship to the building, the orientation and shape of the building, and what kind of space the building actually creates and does is the building um, for example in this scheme here you know it's creating you know two sides of a of a space that is yeah. then the remainder of that space is i would imagine is then kind of created by the the wooded edge that um you know creates a you know a, a space like that and then you can kind of see how the building uh shields views of that reading garden space from the parking and vice versa. So that's, an, I'd say, an important aspect of the L-shaped building to evaluate and consider when thinking about this type of building shape and orientation. Uh, in a similar uh, way, the other two schemes sort of behave a little bit differently. In, the, in this particular scheme, you have an arrival and a whole arrival experience that is pretty much separated visually from whatever is going on in the reading garden. Although, and depending again on the clearing of trees in, in this zone, there may be more of a view of the reading garden or a view to the street from the reading garden that may or may not be appropriate, right? We, we need to kind of sort of debate the merits of all the relationships that are created by the sort of gross moves that we make on the site. You know, where's the parking? Which way is the building oriented? And what's the resultant space that's created? So that's that's really all that these are intending to try to capture. And as far as what that reading garden becomes, or is it really three different types of spaces or one singular space? We're really not sure. And we're very much looking forward to getting into that. Um, I'd say that having visited the site, there, there are, there's a lot of potential, uh, you know, this, this whole zone kind of right in here, I'd say is kind of at the uh, sort of a transitional zone between this kind of open uh, meadow area and a more dense uh, wooded area. So we have a lot of opportunities to create spaces that are either feel very much open and part of the meadow or they feel very much part of the woods. And I think we get to decide as we develop and, and, and take this plan further. Um, it's also, it's questions. also worth, oh, go ahead. Yeah, hi, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I was hearing some questions of, that were being asked earlier of the Conservation Commission and I felt like before we end the meeting, I don't know how long we're going to be going. Um, you know, I should just probably respond to that. Um, and I, and one of the qu couple questions I have is, and you know, maybe you can address it, is with the different scenarios you're talking about. You know, what are we looking at in terms of the difference in square footage of the driveway parking areas from those di different scenarios? Because like, it's hard to gauge. Um, it sounded like from your discussion, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, that of the three options 
um, that they were kind of sounded like they were being presented really in an order of preference with the third one, the L shape, perhaps being the one that was. Um, no, 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 we have not gotten anywhere near that. Okay. Well, I, I guess it was, they were discussing different pros and cons of the different approaches. Um, so right, that we haven't decided, we have not decided what shape and what orientation we okay. are in. The other question I have is um, how many feet of shade reduction beyond what's already indicated here is going to be needed for solar gain for the solar roofs? Do we know how many square, how many linear feet the setback needs to be? Um, I think it, I think it depends on the scheme, probably. Um, we don't know yet, but we'll we'll figure that out as we get into the design of the solar array with our with our solar consultant. It's also but going to depend on the height of the trees themselves. It depends on the height of the trees. It depends on the location of the building. So you know, taking this scheme as an example, if we're putting solar on this entire roof, it's really the the southern end of this building that is the most impacted by adjacent trees. That's because of the building's length, you're taking advantage of that length to create some distance between, you know, a large part of the solar and whatever trees are due south of it. Whereas in a scheme oriented this way, the entire roof is impacted by, you know, trees along its southern edge. And so it's a, it's a different calculus, I think, for a building oriented this way than it is for a building oriented this way. You know, and then and then for this one where we would likely have solar on both legs, um, you know, but but we're also potentially clearing to create space, you know, between those legs for, for a reading garden. I think that we're probably getting the distance that we need just by virtue of the, the clearing that we need to make the building happen. So I, I think it's really scheme dependent. Um, and, and just to reiterate Elaine's comment, we, we don't, we did not put these in order of preference and we have not decided yet where we're leaning. It's too early, I think. What we're trying to do is, is bring along kind of three equal options for siting, for building planning, site planning. And and the the general approach has been to try to make them as equal as possible. And so even though you know parking looks like it is maybe more it's going further into the site in this scheme than it is in this scheme. There's there's more paving in that last one than there is in this one uh, or this one. I think the the intent is that we're going to try to come up with a solution that you know that sort of works equally across these three schemes, and and we may find that you know that there are for whatever reason we lean more towards one of these solutions over the other. But and the the parking solution I don't think is necessarily tied to the building. I mean they they generally work, but I think there's some interchangeability. You know, for instance, this parking and this building, you know, you could just as easily do this parking arrangement with this building orientation um so i we're just not far enough along yet to know um so i hope that clears clears that up thank you um so i don't know what you are looking for from us we're not really in a position to offer um feedback about individual designs at this point i think it's too early for us to do that um you should just know and i know that um some of the library building committee were present and um, Fasson and Neil were present at our last CONCOM meeting where we did talk, have a preliminary conversation about mitigation and that, you know, lots of options are, are possible, but um, if there's going to be impacts to resource areas, including in the buffer zone, we might be looking for applications that would have some mitigation built into them. So we would leave that to you to come up with a proposal for that. Yeah, you have your hand raised. Yes. Um, uh, does, does this work? Can they see me? Yes. OK, I'll talk to, I'll talk to you again. Yeah, I'm Catherine Hilton. I'm chair of the Board of Health. And the Board of Health has a couple of um, interests in this place. The first one is about the septic system. 
And I'm wondering if Fuss and O'Neill are going to be the, the uh, engineers for the second system design, or if that is not decided yet. Yes, so you will be taking over um, septic system design, but also utilizing subcontractor heritage um, who will be assisting us with that. Um, you know, they'll be probably executing the, you know, specifications of it, overseeing for, um, the PERT tests um, and all other kind of requirements um, because of their certifications. And then we'll pull that into our design. So it'll be us and, and our subcontractor. I see. And um, do you have a sense at this point of the design flow for that design? Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet. I've just had very preliminary discussions with Heritage just to kind of give them some of the, the details of, you know, what they're looking to do out here. So you, we don't have that information yet, but as soon as we start to develop that, we can provide it to you. Okay. And I don't know if you or Heritage have experience with um, DEP's form WP70. That's a way of establishing uh, design flow in the sort of non-residential, non-cooking uh, non, uh, uh, facility. Are you at all familiar with yeah, I mean, I know Heritage has assisted us with, you know, septic design on other municipal buildings, uh, schools, other emergency, you know, emergency buildings, things like that. So I'm sure that they've, we've had to execute that same form for those similar sorts of properties. Um, but I can, again, I can, you know, get confirmation for you on that. And, you know, if it's something for some reason that they haven't done before, I'm sure we will we'll be able to, you know, to take care of it. Right. I'm just wondering if, uh, if this could be the septic system could be smaller than is currently being envisioned just because the design flow could conceivably be rather low. Okay, I, you tailed off a little bit at the end, but you were just saying that you were wondering if it could be smaller than we're showing here on these schematics. The actual the actual flow could be fairly low if it could be actually determined by the WP70 um, uh, procedure. Okay. Well, hoping that it might be that the septic field might be smaller than um, than is currently envisioned. Yeah, I mean that you know I think you know, if that that ends up being the case, that's a that's a plus. Um, and you know I think this square footage was just based off of some um, you know kind of you know we took a look at the uh, Title Five kind of stipulations for certain things, occupancy, et cetera, and just kind of for this preliminary sort of uh, sketch came up with, all right, what's kind of the biggest it would be. Um, but, you know, obviously if we're able to reduce it in size, um, that would be, you know, I think a positive toward uh, all aspects of the work. For sure. So are you also gonna cite the well? We will be citing the well. Um, well design and construction will, will be under the purview of the GC. Um, but we will assist in, in citing the well on, on all the plans. Mm -hmm. And of course that well is gonna be a public water supply. Does that, does that, I've tried to find this out from DPP, but I didn't get a, a response. Does the citing of a public water supply well, are there any extra con constraints on it compared to citing an ordinary drinking water well? Um, I believe there are some constraints um, I'm, I'm not sure about siting constraints. I know there's additional testing constraints for a public water supply well, um, and they're largely dependent too on the number of, of people that are served by, you know, said well. You know, there's different um, standards and, and oh, criteria. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've, we've done with some, you know, we've done permitting on other um, public water supply wells, mainly for larger, you know, like, uh, mobile home communities, things like that. Um, so we're, you know, pretty well versed in, in that. And we can take a look at what the specific requirements would be for this based off of the number of people served. Um, I think in terms of siting, I, you know, I, I have to take a look at this again. I, I don't know what other drivers there are. There are some, um, you know, you have to take a look at groundwater under direct influence of surface water, sorts of setbacks from sur map surface water features. Um, that could trigger additional sampling requirements, things like that. So there's a lot of, of kind of nuance to that. But as we 
uh, go about siting of the well itself. You know, obviously we'll be looking into the DEP regulations, but also you know being in touch with you, the Board of Health, to kind of keep you in the loop on that and get your input on um, you know whether you you know like our thought process where we're, where we're looking to put it. You know, and we'll we'll kind of share our 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 thinking of why we're going to put it in a certain area or scoping it for a certain area based off of of you know adherence to the DEP guidelines and regulations. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you. I have uh, one question. We have been talking about having a holding tank of water. Where is that going to be placed? Uh, we haven't located that yet. We so um, Elaine's referring to the fact that because there's no municipal water source here, we need to provide enough water storage on the site in reserve for a automatic sprinkler system. So, you know, based on past experience, I'm guessing that it's going to be something in the order of 15 to 20,000 gallons. So it's a fairly sizable tank underground, either concrete or plastic, depending on the manufacturer that we decide to go with. Um, vented and piped. There it also requires a fire pump in the building. Um, so there, there's some you know, challenges associated with that. There's also a generator that will be required to provide emergency power at a minimum for the fire pump. Uh, but I think there's a desire to provide emergency power for the building as well. So we'll need to talk about the size of that generator, excuse me, the generator and where that would be located. Um, we think it is unlikely that we will be able to provide enough solar um, you know, battery storage to allow for a prolonged use during an outage, you know, more than one day. I think it becomes very cost prohibitive very quickly. And so um, a generator is probably a more realistic option. And then we, the other thing we'll want to talk about is fuel source. And, you know, if it's, we, we probably want to stay away from diesel. So we're talking about maybe a propane generator. And we'll have to talk then about where we're going to locate a propane tank as well. Um, so yeah, the, there are a couple of things that that we'll need to locate, and they're smaller, so they're a little bit easier to find a home for. Um, but we'll need to know what the separation is between that tank, for instance, and the septic leaching field, um, if there is a requirement. Could the holding tank be under the reading garden? Um, it's possible that it could go under the reading garden. Um, it, it has things associated with events and, and, you know, alarms and things like that, that you can remote those and conceal them. They're not, they're not pretty, um, but it's, it's possible that we could get them far enough away from, there's a maximum distance that you can go, but it's possible that we could locate it in a way that that allows us to locate those devices kind of in a planted zone that allows us to screen them. Uh, so that's something we can consider. Okay. I mean, ideally it would go in an area that's already disturbed and on Martha's Vineyard, we put them below the parking lot and uh, right in front of the building. And, um, and that seemed to work. We, it, and that was a bigger system uh, that we'll have here. So you could actually put it below the parking lot? Um, in that case, we did. Uh, it was below asphalt paving, and we were able to to move the vents and the alarms to so that it was in the middle of the parking lot, which was a kind of double uh, double loaded loop. And you know, so we were able to move those about I'd say seventy five feet away uh, to the edge of parking, kind of on the side of the site where we could conceal it with planting. So that's a possibility. So I, I think there's there's a lot more flexibility in terms of how we locate that element than there is the septic leaching field, for instance. Okay, thank you. Any other committee members with questions? I know Mike, you had your hand up for a while. Um, if you still have your question. Mike. I see you're unmuting. Are you? Now 
No? Okay. I'm sorry. We can't hear what you're saying. So, um, any other questions? Just a clarification about that. Just think of the garden and then they have that. You said you could garden in the buffer zone, the 50 foot buffer zone or the 100 foot buffer zone. Someone said that. I don't know. I, I, no. It's really a, a question for conservation commission, but I think many, many gardens are in the buffer zone. If you think about like Wyella, any plantings, any gardens are likely within 25, 50, 100 feet of the lake. So Right. There's no health reason why you couldn't do that. Um, I don't know what the conservation commission would say about siting. Okay, thanks. That's good. And then um, Greg said that at the um, at the Hitchcock, not the Hitchcock, yeah, at the Hitchcock Center, mm -hmm. the gardens are on top of the leach field. In raised beds. In yeah. raised beds. Yeah. But if the leach, if our septic field is way down there, that's right. that's pretty far far from the water, from the water supply, which is yeah. at the library. So yeah, I'd rather see it closer okay. to the library. But I'll give you the steps on All right. on the sizing of okay. that. Okay. Any other questions? We have the team here. Can I can I say something? I have comments. Sure. Comments. Okay. All right. Comments. So I like parking facing west instead of facing east because we don't have a house on the west, but we have a house on the east, so it would be nice not to shine headlights um, in that direction. Um, and then, uh, and then that spruce tree. So mm -hmm. I have, um, I have experience with um, sort of trying to preserve trees in construction zones and um, and so putting that road right around it is going to preserve the roots and it may not survive that anyway. Um, and so, um, you know, to me, it doesn't really seem like that important a tree. Um, I don't think it's a native tree. Um, and um, and it may not survive construction anyway. And it would be a shame to plan around it only to have to remove it later. And so if the driveway could be straight and anyone is free to disagree with me. <coughs> and, um, okay. um, you know, and then we could, you know, just plant trees after the fact. Um, um, that would be really helpful to not have to have that curve around the spruce. I think that would shorten shorten the driveway. driveway. Yeah. Can, I, can I offer a suggestion that uh, it, it's very, I, I agree completely that you're most likely going to lose that tree because you're going to cut its roots when you put in that paving. Um, and, and it's kind of a, a, a waste of money to be trying to save a tree like that when you easily could gain back whatever shade those trees offer by just doing plantings. So I, that's the way I would go. Pl plan to remove all that stuff one way or another between the library and Leverett Road. That, that, that's, my, that's my take on those trees. That they're no, there's nothing there of huge value. That's true. Thank you. They were, I'm pretty sure those were ornamental trees put in by the homeowner, but it's not part of the native Right, uh, woodland that's further back that to me right. is worth considering. Right, I actually think those spruce trees were planted as a uh, little Christmas tree. Christmas tree, oh, yeah. yeah. I wondered about the white pine sort of separate yeah. 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 yeah, they're spruce, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because they they seem somehow All the foreign. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so those those can. Those can go, we can straighten that up. <laughs> Greg, I don't know if you have thoughts or anyone. So that's, I mean, that's great to hear. I think we were taking a conservative position in these early uh, studies. 
but I don't, there's, you know, I, yeah, the wording. I, I, I agree with the assessment of the trees. I, I didn't see anything really um, that valuable in that front part of the site. Another comment, Mayor? No, that's it. Okay. It's a good comment. I'm glad I made it. <laughs> so, I think we were all kind of thinking it, but yeah. why are we preserving that spruce tree? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Is it not feasible to have a loop for the parking so that um, emergency vehicles can just make that loop rather than? Back out. Is that just not fit, or is that more complicated to do? Greg, did you hear that question? I, I, I did not. If if you could please repeat the question, thank you. Yeah, the, the question was about whether or not it's feasible to create a loop for easier, you know, vehicular turnaround um, in general, but also for emergency vehicles. Um, if we, uh, we we had a couple schemes with a loop in it, we'd be glad to circulate. Um, I'm gonna just draw what I roughly. Here, I have them, Greg. If you're pulling up, um, yeah. If if you've got them, um, just to give folks a sense of the scale of what it would take to turn a fire truck, it's. It's a fairly sizable move in relation to the other uh, elements that we're already considering, and you know you, you can put a, a you know a sort of island in the middle, but it, you know we obviously did not get to the bottom of whether such a you know turnaround would be required by for emergency or fire, but I think we when we showed these to Matt and his team. Well, at least on our end, we decided that let's let's not let's try not to do it because it's it's pretty. Not only is it just big and more money and more um, disturbance and impact, but you know the, the the relationship to any kind of space behind the building um, is somewhat compromised by putting that loop in there. In my opinion, you know, it's uh, it's the devil's in the details. There there certainly could be ways to to do it with, you know, screening or something like that. Um, it, it, it could be done, but, you know, again, it just, it, it felt like, for example, with this scheme with the building oriented east west, that we, there's really kind of a, a, a line that we really want to try to avoid bringing cars beyond, if, if at all possible. So now, if, that said, if a drop-off loop of some kind is um, determined to be required for whatever reason, we can definitely do that. And then, you know, certainly, you know, this this part of the site is, you know, high, flat, uh, and outside of generally outside or farther away from the resources. So it's it's a reasonable place to do it. Um, well, I guess we just didn't we. Uh, our initial position was let's try to avoid it. But, you know, there, there, it, it would be feasible for sure if that ends up being required. Excuse me, I'm going to have to be leaving the meeting, so um, just want to make sure there weren't any other questions for the Conservation Commission before I leave. Matt or Greg, do you guys have any questions for Mary? No, I, I think it was great to just get a, an initial impression and um, certainly as you know, we understand that this is not a, an application just yet. So there's, it's hard to really comment specifically, but uh, you know, I think I got enough of an indication of kind of what, you know, emphasis okay. we should be putting in different types of development. And uh, so thank you for the feedback. Well, I appreciate the effort that's being made um, to design this thoughtfully around the wetlands. I recognize it's complicated, but it looks like um, there are several options available to think about. So I'm going to just head out. So thank you again, and uh, we'll stay tuned. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other comments or questions? I have a question. So, um, so the fire truck A turn, will a school bus be able to make the same turn? Uh, Greg, I, I would assume yeah. so, yes. Because I'd like for the school bus to be able to come and drop kids off mm -hmm. and, and leave. I mean, they, they could always just drop them at the end of the driveway. It's not that far. And how often does that happen? It's never happened in the history of the show. Uh, okay. <laughs> you want it to be frequent. You want it to be frequent. Okay. Right. Uh, like once a week, once, once a month. Once, once a week. week. Yeah. So if it, my, I mean, Greg, you tell me if you think differently, but we had talked about if this is emergency vehicular turnaround. Right. We could take the approach of having, you know, a grass area that has some stabilizers in the soil under it so that it can bear the weight okay. of the fire truck, which would be very infrequent. Right. Um, if it's a once a week occurrence, I don't know that that's as an as appropriate a solution. Greg, I don't know how you feel about that. No, grass pave typically works. Uh, Pretty well to grow grass if you're, you know, infrequently driving on it, like to the tune of once a week, once every two weeks, and not parking over it or shading the the grass. So from what was described, you know, an incidental twenty minute, thirty minute use uh, of a school bus coming in, dropping off, maybe a little bit of waiting, so forth. I think you could probably successfully grow grass on it, keep it green. Um, the big difference I'd say is that for the, the difference in my mind, at least between a building a functional drop off turnaround for a bus versus a hybrid bus slash emergency vehicle turnaround or fire truck turnaround is that the fire department should or would likely require that you maintain that turnaround in the winter, plow it. And so then you need a plowable surface, um, which changes things a little bit. You can plow grass pave or snow blow it or what have you, but maybe it's less about the choice of material and more just about the awareness that you will have to you'll, you'll have to perform that you know maintenance activity. Whereas with a bus, if it's just simply a bus turnaround or drop off, you probably could just tell them you know hey we're going to do something different you know when there's snow on the ground. Maybe okay, that'd be one right. way to yeah, think about it. And then you're less hampered with a requirement to keep that yeah, space clear through the winter. Well, also, um, if you think about it, there are, there are many of us who have very extended length driveways that don't have turnarounds. And so I would like to get in touch with the fire department and see if they figured out workarounds that they really don't turn around that they actually back up. The the thing is that this is a, a public building mm -hmm. and the yeah. building code may not allow us to do what we do in our private residence. Right. right. My, I don't know. Generally don't, speaking in my experience, they'll back up and every fire department is different, you know, and they have quite a bit of of um, discretion, I believe. Uh, but that generally they won't back up if, you know, more than 150 or 200 feet. Um, so they're, they're asking them to back up is a solution up to a certain limit of length, right? And so they might say, Jesus is 300, 400 feet. That's too far to back up. You know, you're going to need to turn around. Or they might say, okay, we can do that. Again, in, in my experience, there's a lot of discretion and that's why having a direct conversation at the appropriate time is really kind of the way, the only way to, to do it. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And the school bus could just drop at the road. Sure. You know, you know. Sure, um, there could be some, there'll be somebody waiting for the kids to right. walk I mean, up. it's not going to be kindergarten to get dropped off by themselves. At the no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. And it could actually be, I mean, the school bus would probably be dropping off like five minutes. <laughs> really cool. And that would be good exercise for them. 
<laughs> I guess the the well, yes. you know, uh, accessibility would be a, con a consideration there. Um, in other true. words, if you were to make, let's just say hypothetically, we, we kind of built a shoulder where a bus could kind of come, you know, and pull off and then we, we yeah. developed a sidewalk that connected into the building that'd be kind of like minimally what i would want to propose if you were if we were assuming drop drop off at the street i guess i would ask the question you know is does that satisfy accessibility concerns it, it, or you know there obviously will be accessible parking spaces proximate to the building uh, but i don't know you know what types of accessible drop off requirements there might be if those uh, persons would be coming in the same school bus as all the other students or not. And it's just something we'd want to think about in terms of universal access to the building. Right, and, and I would think that that kind of thing, um, there are vans uh, for transportation of, um, some students that wouldn't have trouble um, because they around. they'll have trouble with the regular school bus right, right. so they wouldn't be yeah. on a regular right. school bus right, so, right. That, that, that may be the case in which case if it's a van then they should be able to just simply oh, yeah. you know yeah. pull here and, and turn around just like a car yeah sure is is there any requirement in these occasions when the school bus is coming with kids that the school bus is parking somewhere and waiting for them or it would drop them off leave come right. back and pick them no up. no this no. would just be the kids getting like coming to the library after school oh okay it's not like uh during the day no no no, no, no. Okay. During the day, yeah trip they walk yeah. yeah okay they walk from the school they won't have to walk right. Right. they walk to the library now okay. and they um, walk up here yeah. at town hall so. yeah Okay. Yeah, it's only half the distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. So yeah, no, this would just be kids getting off the bus at yeah. you know okay. um, to hang out at the library yeah. or for a program. Yeah. yeah. Would it be the first sidewalk in the summer? <laughs> <laughs> There's a sidewalk at the school along the oh, yeah. front of the school. Yeah. yeah. I don't really think we need I mean, a it... sidewalk. Yeah. You, you you don't think that there's a general need for a sidewalk from the street to the building? I don't know. I don't think the That's true. Yeah. That's true. Dual purpose with the driveway. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we we could also plan for a three to four foot gravel shoulder that would at the yeah. at the least it would allow a person who's walking from the street. To step off the road into a relatively level, you know, dry area adjacent to the pavement to allow cars to pass while they're walking in. That's simple, probably good idea, regardless of what you do. Yeah. Neil, you had something? No, I was just concerned if we had sufficient grades to make the sidewalk accessible from the street. Greg, do you think we could make an accessible path from the street to the building? We, uh, well, let's see. One, two, three, six, seven. It's like seven or eight feet. I think so. Yeah, over 350 feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, it looks like the toughest spot would be at the road. Right, just this zone right here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would say Mary has a question. All right, Mary Lou, do you have a question? Hi, my name is Mary Lou Kanka. And my question is, um, if in the building of this library, there's any concern about the house that Marianne was speaking of having a water filtration system, is, is that of any concern to the water that will be coming into the library since they are very, very close 
to each other. We're talking about 62 Leverett Road and 66 Leverett Road. Thank you. Yeah, I can speak to that quick. I mean, there's going to be, uh, there will be required analytical sampling because this is a uh, public water supply well. So the state, you know, will dictate a certain parameter list of, of uh, you know, analyses that will need to be run. And obviously we're aware of the, the PFAS condition um, that exists. Um, related to the the fire department and the, and the wells in the vicinity that, that that require filtration because of that. So obviously that would be, you know, I think the state dictates now that PFAS is tested on every uh, potable water well before it, it comes online or at least public potable water wells. Um, so that would be something that would would you know this well would be subject to that testing as well. And um, you know that you know general knowledge of, of area impacts always comes into account whenever you're citing any sort of um, portable water supply well. So, you know, that'll be taken into account and, and the well will be tested, um, you know, accordingly. And if I could just follow up on that, if the PFAS is found in the new library well, then filtration would be added to the system and the problem would be taken care of. Right. It's not something that would eliminate having a well there. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question, if I may. Sure. Is this lot being divided into two separate pieces of land? No. Okay, so when we're speaking about the library lot, we're talking about the whole of the acreage that exists in lot 03266 Leverett Road? We're talking about citing the library on the lot. We're not talking about using the entire lot for the library. Okay, so then is this lot being divided into two separate pieces of land? No. Yeah, this apologies. This uh, there's a line here that appeared in the survey that we're not totally sure what it is, but we, we have it labeled here as forested edge. It kind of roughly delineates a boundary between a, a forested area and a, a more densely forested area and a, a less dense area, but it's not intended to mean anything really specific in this diagram. Uh, so we should probably just eliminate that. It, it might read like a property line, but that's that's not part of our proposal. Thank you. Some comment. Yes. Um, this regards uh, Mary Ann's question about parking and headlights. If you look along the border right now where they show, I think, addition of planting. And also thinking that, you know, along that eastern, right, where the house is coming. Mm -hmm. So you can see all the addition of trees, but also I'm thinking of, you know, in terms of trade-offs, so trees that are going to get cut down from the parking to that edge could be an area to densely plant. And white pines are native, and you don't need that much height, so you don't have to plant a huge white pine to really start to screen headlights. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that you know a parking scheme like this should still be in consideration that works just because you can you know if that area gets heavily planted it'll it'll really screen the house from from headlights and that could be some of the remediation yes. that we do yeah. for um, I mean, yeah. if you brought if you brought that planting all the way up to the edge let's say that's the parking scheme that is that is utilized. And you brought up, you know, this, this dense, say, planted forest, it will say, with a mix of natives, including white pine. You know, you could have deciduous and white pine, you could have mixed hardwood. Um, it could really take care of that as an issue. That's true. Don't look like a parking lot is lately um, south of where the 
Yes. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any questions for us? Um, no, I, I mean, I think this was helpful. I think um, we will have questions, I'm sure, as we get into this more. There's, there, we still have a lot of work to do um, before we're kind of settling on one approach that we've collectively agreed is the right solution for the building, for the parking, for you know, site plan uh, design. I, I think we're not quite there, but hope to be there by the end of the month. Maybe it's a good opportunity to just talk briefly about schedule for everybody's benefit. We are, um, we're here where this blue line is, March 16th. We're a little bit more than halfway through schematic design. We've got to the end of April when we're gonna be putting together a, price, a set of pricing documents for our estimator. Um, we are thinking that you know somewhere by the end of this month and or early April, we're settling on a kind of preferred approach, at which point we can get our um, engineers, uh, you know, specification writers, all you know, all of our various consultants uh, developing their pricing documents uh, so that by the end of April we're submitting that work. Cost estimator will take about you know, half of the month of May to estimate the project and um, sort of finalize the budget and then move into the next phase, which is design development, which will be about a three month phase as well. So I think we're, we're sort of where we expect it to be right now. Um, I think in the coming weeks, we will solidify our opinions about the building and, and building siting and parking, and, you know, with, with building committee's help, obviously. And I think at some point, maybe soon, we want to have a conversation with the fire department. Uh, okay. So so we understand what the uh, what the emergency vehicle access concerns are. Do you want them to come to the next design subcommittee? We, we could do that. Yeah. OK. That would, that would work. And the yeah. And the police chief? Yeah. OK. I think we may as well do All right. That. All right. Um, you know, they all, our experience is that that ultimately it's the local fire department that sort of makes the call about what they're willing to do with their fire trucks in an emergency mm -hmm. situation. So I think it'll be important to have that conversation. Um, so I, that's that's kind of where we are in the process. Of, you know, we're we're about where we need to be right now, and I'm sure as we get further into this over the next month, we'll we'll have some questions. One, I guess, one question is when do we imagine going formally to conservation commission for our first hearing? I you uh, Penny, I would think you would go when you have a firm site plan. Um, so, uh, and Greg, you can weigh in here. Typically. We don't go through site plan review until the end of design development. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think having an informal meeting today to understand, you know, before we get too far down the road, understanding what the guardrails are in terms of what we think we yeah, can and can't do. It seems like you didn't get too much information today. Though. We, we didn't. And so I, I worry a little bit about going all the way to the end of design development before we're submitting officially to Concom. I worry about that too. I would not advise that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you want, they, I expect they're not going to formally give you an opinion until you formally give them a plan. And that gives a little bit of a conundrum. Yeah. So let me ask Greg and Matt, if you, from your perspective, do you think at the end of schematic design, you know, we'll have, at that point, we'll have a single design, we'll have a site plan that, you know, we've all sort of agreed is the right approach at a schematic level. Do you think that at that point it makes sense to go to CONCOM in a more official capacity, or is there a risk of going too early? In my experience, it's like 50 to 75% DD level is 
works pretty well, you know, and that my understanding of the sort of technical backup required to, for a successful, you know, NOI and process with conservation, you know, Matt and his team are going to need to do some deeper work than what would be typically expected for schematics. So that, you know, we're going to need, we're going to need time to get there, but we also don't want to finalize DD, you know, without, in my opinion, without having more confidence that we're on the right track, uh, both from both the site plan and a con uh, conservation commission perspective. So I think there's some sweet spot in there in the D, in the late DD phase that's probably makes sense. So of course late DD is is deep summer so which is probably challenging in terms of scheduling meetings. I wonder if maybe we should try and target um, late June which would put us around 50% DD uh, and and hopefully you know, kind of get slip in there before, at least before the July 4th holiday. August is a, usually a pretty terrible month in terms of or scheduling meetings. So. Totally agree with that. I think that, you know, the degree to which we can maintain a kind of informal dialogue with everyone, I think that will aid us in getting to a better place by a 50% DD. Well, we're, we're, you know, that's the best we can do. We understand there's limitations to what the commission can comment on without a formal submission, but if you know if we're getting fire, police, you know, board of health, other people to kind of give us suggest that we're on the right track, I guess, and you know that that will help us. It'll put us in a better place and give us more confidence that we can invest more in the drawings without those um, or you know leading up to those approvals. Um, just wanted to, to note one thing um, in regards to the timeline for an NOI submittal is we also are proposing to initially submit an NOI for the debris, um, you know, wetland restoration, wetland restoration um, activities uh, behind the, you know, pr proposed site for the library. So that, you know, and if I guess correct me if I'm wrong, we would have to get through that NOI and close it out that our our COC before we could open up the NOI for the build. So that may, um, you know, drive that timeline as well. So even if we're targeting June, you know, that may not be feasible because of that initial NOI, which, you know, the town is proposing. But you're not submitting a notice of intent in June. You're just going in for a more, a slightly more formal conversation in June, right? I mean, if that's the case, that's that's fine. I I guess we we thought that you were saying to submit NOI by June. Um, you know, if if the thought process is just to go in front of them for a, a more detailed discussion at an actual meeting, that that's fine in June, and it'll probably run concurrent with our attendance for a meeting in support of the other existing NOI. We could kind of tie that all together. Um, so when would the actual you know, when when would you hope then to have NOI submitted for the build? That would be at the end of the summer, at the end of DD. I, I was hoping you could tell us what, what we should be planning for. I mean, that, you know, if I think we definitely want to have another conversation with um, Conservation Commission, either yeah, and, and it could be informal either at the end of SD or sort of midway through DD. I, I don't know as it relates to the timing and of, of the NOI submission and how long it's going to take to get approval once we submit um, in terms of when we should be timing that. So I, Matt, I don't know if you have a recommendation to make. I mean, do you feel like if we submit at the end of August that that's reasonable in terms of the rest of the timeline you know moving into construction documents is there is there any risk of pushing it out that far i think that seems like a reasonable timeline we'll definitely just have to keep an eye on how the first wetland restoration notice of intent goes along um, but having a more informal meeting with the conservation commission and, and getting on their agenda to bring that 
you know, schematic design or, you know, very, very preliminary uh, design development will provide an opportunity for them to really give more candid input. And we did receive some input during the last conservation commission meeting, but um, it was quite preliminary because we didn't have any specific layouts to, to really discuss. Mary, David, you had your Yeah, I, and again, I'm on the conservation committee, so I would, I would go ahead and do it and get a, a preliminary so we can get feedback. Um, and we meet twice in June, if that's a help, we meet on the set second and fourth of every month, the second and fourth Thursday of every month, just so you can have that as a perspective. And Mary, meet twice in July. You usually meet twice in July? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. So I have a question for you, Matt. Is it is it up to the committee, the building committee, to now think about those three orientations that you have presented and for us to make the decision which one we think we want to go forward with? So we, we had a meeting um, with the smaller yep. client group the other day, and, or yesterday, if that was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what we said at the end of that meeting was we didn't feel like we were at a point yet where we where we could make a recommendation or where we were asking for the committee to to make a determination about which is the right um, option to pursue. And what we decided was we wanted to continue to pursue each of these with building planning and massing, you know, thrown into the mix as well. Because that's it's that's as important as the site planning. Um, and that we probably need a few more weeks before we're ready to say, okay, now we'd like your feedback on which is the preferred option to move ahead with for the remainder of thematic design. So I think we're we're still not quite there. We have a meeting with you guys scheduled next Tuesday. Um, and then we've got a design meeting scheduled the Wednesday the following week, I believe. And I think by then we will probably be in a position where we're able to, we'll, we'll probably have our own recommendation to make in terms of which option we think. So we're talking about our April 4th meeting that will. I, March 20th. Well, March 20th is, March 20th. The, is the meeting. Um, March 21st is, is our meeting next week. Yeah, so but I, then April 4th would be the meeting where you think that you'd be coming to us. Yeah, I, and I think that's final. that's okay. the right time. That gives okay. us basically the month of April to, to take that preferred scheme and develop okay. that to a schematic level for pricing. Okay, that's so, that, that's helpful for me. Yeah. So, we'll, so I think we have one more building committee meeting. We'll give you an update on progress next week. We'll follow that up with another design meeting the week after, and then the following week we'll meet with you again as a Great. committee, and uh, Great. And, and hopefully have a decision by then. Okay, thank you. Everyone, I'm sorry to do this, but I have to take off. Um, That's okay. Thank you for the thank feedback. I appreciate it. Nice to meet everyone. Okay. Uh, Lily, Lily from our office is still on. She can uh, answer any questions and take some notes. Or, uh, so thank you very much. All right, thank you. Okay. So are there any other questions? I think I might have uh, another comment. This is related to our, our meeting yesterday when uh, Jeff raised the uh, question about the large and septic. Um, up until 2019, I was a resident of Maryland. And um, in Maryland, if you were building uh, and this was a fairly new uh, requirement. If you're building anywhere adjacent to any of the tributaries or wetlands adjacent to Chesapeake Bay, when you put in a septic, you had to follow what's called best available practice. And what I know of it is, it's a, I think, a three compartment septic tank. And the gentleman who was uh, talking to us about it, he had a glass full of what looked like clear water. He said, This is what comes out. He said, think you could drink it he said i wouldn't <laughs> but it's that clear and i would think that kind of tank is available and if that was put in i can't imagine a system 
when you have a much longer life. And personally, I think that 20, 25 years is, if you're carefully maintaining it, rather short for the life of it. So it's really a terrain feel, right? Not ten. But I don't know if people are aware of that. You know, if that's a requirement, but it seems like something to consider so that you wouldn't have to be as concerned about putting in a new raised bed in 20 or 25 years. Yeah, so Matt, this question came up at our meeting yesterday. I, I don't know if you guys have um, any thoughts on this, but it, it was a question about the life expectancy for the leaching field to septic and you know what what should we be anticipating? So if we if we're saying you know there are limited options for where that raised bed can go, and we put it in the location where we proposed, and at a certain point it has sort of gotten to the end of its useful life, and we have to then find another place for a leaching field uh, because that that area can't be used anymore. Maybe it's different for a raised bed than it is for uh, something that's in ground, but do you have any thoughts on that that you can offer? Um, it's a good question. Um, I can follow up with, with Amy on our end and then Heritage as well. I think, you know, it may be possible with a raised uh, leaching field to, to kind of remove and replace once it's re reached its, uh, you know, its limit. Um, I know the lifespan on those are fairly long. Um, you know, I, you know, 40, 50 years, I would think, but um, yeah, that's that's a good question. And we can take that into account too when we're, we're taking a look at siting and see, you know, if we can get a, an age range from, from uh, Heritage and look into what the, you know, when that does happen, what are some of the options, you know, is, is with a raise, are you able to just kind of level it off again and rebuild the mound, um, you know, that, that might be one option or, you know, are you able to raise it further? You know, I, I, you know, I don't know. So yeah, we'll, we'll take a look into that and see if we can come up with some answers before the next time we meet. Okay, that'd be great. The, I think the concern came from, you know, the 25 year lifespan of a residential bleaching field. Hmm. So it sounds like the, you know, commercial uh, system like you're describing has a much longer life expectancy. Um, and I don't, I don't know what kind of system you're, you're using. We, we did a micro fast system on the, or on the, yeah, on the Cape that was adjacent to a kettle pond. So, that, you know, water uh, conservation was you know, a critical concern. And, um, you know, it's, uh, there was some, I, I don't know that technology very well, um, but there was something about that tank that performed better. And so to Stephen's point, I think it maybe reduced some of the pressure on the leaching field end of the system. But so I don't know if you guys have thoughts yet about what this system is gonna be. Yeah, um, you know, I think once we get into, uh, you know, deeper discussion with Heritage too, and start looking at some of the options, uh, like I said, we've done a, a fair amount of municipal build outs recently, and I'm sure not all of them are on municipal sewer. So I'd be interested to, uh, to see if we've had, you know, situations similar to this where, um, you know, we're trying to minimize, you know, the size or impact of a leaching field through some other sort of system. So um, I know my residential one's uh, 50 years old and, and still going. So you do, I just got a little nervous there with that. <laughs> thinking about the, uh, the lifespan but um yeah i will uh i'll try to get a little more information on that and hopefully you know the next time we all meet you know can present some of those ideas and um you know obviously cost will come into play there too in terms of you know i'm sure any of those sorts of you know systems multi-tank systems are all going to be you know significantly more expensive so that would be taken into account but um maybe there's some sort of, of you know thread the needle option that you know helps a little bit on on one end and doesn't cost as much on the other all right thank you yes we certainly see in town that septic systems last much longer than 20 to 25 years as long as they're properly maintained right. and properly cited 
and they normally have a reserve area built into the design. And sometimes that reserve, reserve area is actually between existing new trenches. So you've got a new trench and a space for another trench. Yeah. And it may be that it would be simple to, uh, if it were necessary to move into the reserve area, to have a fairly simple switch where the effluent would go into uh, a prepared reserve area. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I don't think we have any other questions. This is very helpful, though. So thank you. To thank everybody. you, everyone, for uh, joining us and all of you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. So the meeting is officially adjourned. Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn the? I made a motion to adjourn. Second. Stephen seconded. Uh, Stephen seconded. Let's see. Mary. That's I. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, Brad, are you there? Yep. Brad's gone. Okay. Okay. There's um, Penny. Hi. Molly. Hi. And Elaine. Hi. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you